Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Training Hard and Smart Workload Guidelines for Return to Rugby. You're very welcome uh, to today. Um, my name is David Keane with the IRFU and I'm joined today by experts in the medical and athletic performance and also coach development departments who are going to give you a very interesting um, webinar today and information today on getting back into training as well. So this webinar is for anyone involved in planning training sessions and workload for clubs and schools players as well. I'd love to just pass you on to uh, Dr. Nick Nicol Van Dyke, the Injury Surveillance and Medical Research Officer at the IRFU, and he is going to introduce um, his team as well um, throughout today. So Nicol, great to see you. Thanks, David. Um, thanks for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I know it's a difficult time now as we get back to a more regular activities over lunchtime, but it's great that you're uh, able to join us. Um, on the call today is myself uh, from the medical department as well as Katrina Yeomans, um, our high performance game coordinator, um, uh, and Patrick Dolan, our PhD researcher and strength conditioning coach. Uh, with the IRIS project down in Limerick. So Patrick is joining us from the States and we're very happy to have Patrick on the call. He was supposed to join us last week if you tuned in, but um, lucky to have him today. And what we're going to do, so this is part of a, a three part series. If you tuned in last week, we hope uh, you, you found some value in the warm up um, components that we discussed. Today we're going to talk about training load and then um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll tee up the next one as well, where we'll do more readiness for contact type work. Um, uh, so David, if you can start the presentation uh, for us. Before we get into uh, um, uh, our presentation today, I'd just like, I'd like to mention Martin Kennedy, the lead for our National Athletic Development Pathway, was going to join us, but unfortunately he couldn't be here. So we're very, very lucky to be joined by uh, Nick Winkleman, who's the head of athletic performance at the IRFU. I'm going to introduce Nick just a little bit later. Um, um, and if we could go on to the next slide, who's got control now? Is it Patrick or, or you, David? But we, now. Oh, great. So, so we just wanted to remind you again that um, uh, over the coming months, we're going to introduce our Engage, our rugby readiness program. So our Engage program, uh, we're really looking forward to that and, and uh, I'm looking forward to being able to share some of that content with you. And some of it will be what we do discuss in these webinars, uh, but we're, we're putting that together and hopefully we'll launch it uh, towards uh, the beginning of next season. Um, so uh, in that sense, we're really, we're really excited about sharing some of that with you now today. And we're hopefully going to have more events like this um, where we can share this. So I'm going to turn over to Patrick now, who's going to just give you a brief summary of what we discussed uh, last week, um, but also add a little bit to that uh, to give uh, um, a little bit more information around some of the exercises we can do to be rugby ready. So Patrick, over to you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I think I have control here now. Should be good. There we are. Yeah, good. Um, so look, there's th there's going to be three primary components to a, to a proper training session and even a match. Certainly there might be differences in duration and intensity, but the fundamentals don't change. Um, so if you did join us last week, hopefully they didn't seem too basic, um, but they are priorities for sure. Uh, as David mentioned, the PDF uh, and the, the webinar from last week, uh, as well as our upcoming ones, will be sent out for resources to be implemented from all the coaches and athletes that are joining us. But just in a quick recap, the three components being a dynamic preparation, this phase doesn't have to take longer than really four or five minutes. Um, it's a great opportunity to just set the scene, uh, get the squad together, get mentally ready, get the heart rate up, get some blood into the legs, etc. Uh, 15 meter grid uh, is a great uh, just kind of uh, distance to, to target for 10 to 15 meters, 10 reps out and back. Again, it doesn't take more than 45 minutes. Things like butt kicks, high knees, our general A's, B skips, some Frankensteins and leg swings, some general hamstring openers. Um, all those dynamic movements that a lot of us are familiar with at this point. Um, and then the second kind of phase that we would move into, again, another four or five minutes, some particular basic uh, movement patterns or, or more of our muscle activation and individual prep. Uh, last week, we reviewed things like the squat and squat pattern, um, the, the importance of a lunge, uh, how to hinge and disassociate the posterior chain and activate the hamstrings, um, as well as some trunk uh, and rotary st uh, stabilization. Uh, so those are things that we reviewed, and as David said, they'll be shared. 
Um, and then in our upcoming one, uh, we'll obviously review the importance of, of how to prime and, and get ready for contact uh, and also add in some some speed and acceleration work um, at that component as well before really getting into your first drills of the training session. We're mindful today, though, uh, before we do return to the pitch, there's obviously stuff that you want to do rather than just, you know, simply watch these webinars and educate yourself. There's some ownership and accountability that we can take from a physical standpoint. So today, what we're going to do is just review a couple movements that you can start to do at home. Um, so we're just calling this kind of a little series uh, IRFU at home. And these are some basic strength exercises that can be done uh, with very little resources as far as equipment, time or space. Uh, and things that have identified areas uh, of, of injury rates that, that Katrina and Nicole had pointed out last week. The Copenhagen, a lot of you are probably familiar. I'm going to just play a quick video here for you so we can watch that. Uh, some, some tendencies here are those hips are going to drop. We want to make sure we keep those hips high. Your hips might kind of sit back with a, a crease in the hips. Be sure to push that butt forward. Pull that chest back nice and proud. Uh, and drop that head into neutral. So thanks to the players for these following demos. Uh, they do a really, really great job. Um, and then you can see just a little bit of a stiff straight leg raise out of that bottom, pushing away through the floor, through that elbow. So creating that full body tension, head to toe. That's the Copenhagen, awesome to reduce uh, injuries around that groin. So we'll move on to the next one here. Next one, we have just a squat jump. Awesome power development, but also to build some uh, tolerance uh, into the lower body. I'll go ahead and click play on that. So really good athletic base to start out. When you're in that starting position and even again into your landing, trying to distribute the weight throughout that whole foot, uh, but particularly in that midfoot. That midfoot's where you're going to get the most power, most force, uh, and, and most speed and explosiveness out of that bottom position. As you land, don't be passive. As soon as those feet contact, actively stretch that rubber band down into that midfoot, sit that butt back into that chair, uh, and make sure we're obviously utilizing that arm swing throughout. Again, good tension through the core. So awesome demos there. We'll move to the next one. And you'll see in the PDF uh, to everyone that's on right now that comes out, there's a lot of good progression uh, to how many sets and reps and all that stuff. I don't want to waste too much time going through that right now, uh, but we will get to that uh, as you get to the PDF. So move on to the next one. Uh, shoulder and, and upper body uh, injuries, obviously a primary target. So making sure we get a lot of force and load through the upper extremities. So we have the, the press up here, the push up. You see he's doing a really good job stabilizing that spine and that trunk. He doesn't have an arch. He's got good tension in the glutes. His hands are about shoulder width apart. And he's got good traction of those elbows. We don't want to see those elbows going crazy or flipping out. We want good, solid traction of the elbows there to make sure we're stabilizing through that shoulder girdle. The last thing I'll say for the press up, try and go nose, shoulders, and hips touching the ground at the same time. A good regression, depending on your age or your level out there, is to just go ahead and use a couch or a table or a chair, uh, any stable surface that you're not going to get injured on or slip off of, and go ahead and just elevate your center of gravity a little bit to make sure that we can get proper technique. And then the last movement we'll move on to here is the Nordic hamstring. So some of us might cringe uh, when we see this. Uh, and obviously I'll just, I'll point out right away that a lot of us won't have this uh, equipment or resource. There actually are pretty nifty uh, ways to build these for, for fairly cheap, just a few quid uh, if you're handy or, or a carpenter. Um, but if you have a little brother or sister, go ahead and just get them to anchor down on your heels. Uh, some common tendencies here. You can see he's doing an excellent job keeping those hips extended forward. A lot of times on the way down, our hips tend to stay back and we just fold over at the chest. We want to keep that butt nice and tight moving forward and just let that knee joint continue to open up as slow as you can, controlling that full range of motion and then obviously letting those hands protect yourself right at that last range of motion. So those are, again, some four excellent exercises that everyone can kind of take some ownership on right now to reduce your likelihood of injuries as we do return back to the pitch, uh, but also going to optimize your performance. Uh, in a lot of the areas as well. Patrick is actually 
nominated uh, um, as well as a CSCCA, that's the Strength and Conditioning Association in America as a Young Coach of the Year. So good luck with that nomination. Patrick, thank you for sharing that knowledge. So for the coaches on the call, you know, if there are players that are still stuck at home, they can't get to training, these are great exercises to potentially share um, with them. We are going to quickly just um, uh, just remind you, so, so the bulk of what today will be about is now going to be around training mode. Uh, key principles that we can can remember, and the things to remember um, uh, here is um, that we have spent a lot of time without uh, structured uh, um, um, uh, training, of course, right? So now, so the the players that's coming back needs to have some time to adapt. We spoke about this a little bit last time, and um, uh, so we've had a long period. We've had different types of in iterations of training during lockdown and we are looking at this phased return to contact training um, uh, and and that's purposeful and so Nick Winkleman who's the um, the head of our uh, um, athletic performance uh, Nick's going to talk about this in detail and give you some of the insights into how you might what you keep in mind what you pay attention to and how you might structure this um, program so we're very very fortunate to have Nick Join us for this webinar today. Nick, thank you for your time and over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nicole and Patrick for, for great insights so far. And, and David and Orla and Jamie and everyone listening for, for being here today and organizing. I'm just going to request control of the slides and then we will uh, we'll crack on. Brilliant. Uh, there we go. Beauty of technology. So Training load management. Um, we're still learning about this ourselves <laughs> from a professional sport perspective. So let me let me put your mind at ease at these these fancy words. We're going to try to not make them very fancy. The simple thing is how do we, uh, so to speak, progressively increase our players' exposure to training load such that they can thrive, they can perform, and not have any unnecessary exposure to injury and so that's just the heartbeat of what we're going to be discussing when it comes to training load management sometimes you'll hear it referred to as workload management or just load management these are all synonyms that mean the exact same thing and so what i want to do here is, is take you on a little bit of a journey on how training load management can inform the way you organize things like volume so how much time on feet and intensity, how hard you go when you're on feet from a training perspective. Also giving insight to some of the various influencers that ultimately determine someone's readiness to train day in, day out. And so we'll go through this one piece at a time. There are two major resources, two major resources that will be emailed to you after this presentation. So in addition to the slides, we have a return to rugby PDF that Martin Kennedy and others put together that will mimic in terms of strategies what I'm going to talk about now. But we're also going to share the world rugby player loading or training load management guidelines, which provide some really nice background if you want to go deep, but also an infographic. Again, I'm going to be sharing some of those insights. So know that you don't need to consume all of this right now. We'll give you some nice resources to support your comprehension and application of these insights. So let's start with the definition from World Rugby. What is training load management? Well, uh, it is a system that reduces the risk of injury through planning and managing life training and to a lesser extent, match playing loads. Obviously, when it comes to the match, we want our players to thrive. We want them to go out and be able to do whatever they need to do to, to win the game, to have fun playing the game. And so to put them in the best position to do that, we really have to look at how we are planning and prescribing on the training load, recognizing that stuff on and off the pitch will influence that. And so what we have to think about by way of an analogy is that all of us, right? It doesn't matter how old we are, all of us has a fixed amount of physical stuff our body is ready to deliver day in, day out. 
And so we can think of our body's resources like a glass. And our job as coaches and recognizing this as players is to make sure that we do not overfill the glass. We do not ask more of our body from an extreme sense than what we are capable of delivering. And so when we talk about training load management, it's making sure that we're only filling that glass up to the level of room that we have left from an athlete perspective. And the system that we're going to outline is going to help you make sure that you top up your athlete, your player's glass, uh, training session after training session without spending too much time in that overflow state where we increase the odds of unnecessary injury. And so the way that we're going to look at this, and again, this is an infographic from World Rugby, is that there are a number of contributors, number of contributors that influence training load and my ability to respond to it. And we're going to think of those across personal as well as training. So think of it as life load, what's happening in my life versus training load, what is physically being asked of me. Now, just to make these two variables of life load and training load feel a little bit more personal, I want to give you a quick little thought experiment, two quick questions. So consider the following scenario. And in fact, using the chat function just to follow along, feel free to actually put your answer uh, in the chat function. Otherwise, just reflect on it yourself. So consider the following scenario. Which of the following might negatively impact the physical and mental energy you need to play a sport? And so when we look at this, poor nutrition or being underfed, do you think that might negatively impact your energy and readiness to play a sport or go to training? Uh, being on your feet all day, possibly. A fight with a loved one. Preparing for a meeting or possibly a test. A bad night's sleep or all of the above. And so feel free if you want to play along to check in your answer in the chat function. But I think most of us are probably going to say, well, all of the above, all of those things could negatively impact physical and mental energy needed to play in practice. And so we know that physical and mental stress in life will directly impact the training load you or your players can tolerate. And we think of this as life load. So as a player, as a player, I need to think about how am I managing these things? How am I getting the best night's sleep possible? Managing my stress, making sure I have proper nutrition, going through other recovery and regeneration strategies. As a coach, do you have a pulse on these things? At the very least, are you conversing with your players to get a sense of how they're traveling, how they're feeling? Because you could have identical training sessions on let's say Monday week one, Monday week two, Monday week three, but your players will not have an identical response to those if on one day they had a great night's sleep, well fed, feeling good, and on another they were up all night studying, they forgot to eat breakfast, and now they come in there undercooked. So if we are not paying attention to the life load, we are missing a trick. Within professional rugby, what we do is we actually have daily questionnaires to start to get at this, but ultimately guess what it comes down to? It comes down to a conversation with the person that ultimately lives inside of the player. Okay, second scenario, just to attune us, to connect us to training load. So say for example, if you currently can squat 100 kilos. Nickel, I don't know if I can squat 100 kilos, but let's just go with it. So which of the following load ranges makes the most sense to progress to next? So you're in the gym, you can do 100K comfortably for a few repetitions. Which of the following would be the increase in weight you personally would prescribe to yourself? Well, would you increase your load by 10 to 20%? Would you increase your load, are you ambitious, by 20 to 30 percent or would you jump right there Jamie I know you jump there to 30 to 40 percent now reflect on that think about it if you want to play along chuck your answer in the chat function but I think most reasonable most reasonable individuals at least if they care about their low back and knees are going to be selecting a right probably somewhere between 10 to 20 percent increase and so we know this intuitively 
And thus we wanna bring that intuition to bear when it comes to our own training, when it comes to the practices we design. So gradual progression ensures players safely build tolerance. They can adapt rather than breaking down. And we're gonna call this training load. And so we have life load, we have training load. We need to be sensitive to both. The question is, how do we actually get a grip on training and life load? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about next. So how do we manage training load? Again, I'm gonna float between the World Rugby infographic and our own return to rugby insights. You will be getting all of these after the presentation. So the first thing when we look at, well, how do we manage training load? Well, we need to know what we are managing. And that means we need to understand how to talk and think about our sessions. And so, well, frequency, how many sessions do I have a week? Volume, how many minutes per session? Intensity, how hard, how hard does the session feel to the individual? Now in professional rugby, we can use things as you see down here, like GPS and heart rate to get a very objective measure of intensity. But we still use this thing here on the right that we call the RPE scale, the rate of perceived exertion, where after every single training session, we ask a player, how hard was it? And on a scale of one resting to 10 maximal effort, where you can think of nine or 10 really should be a match or the absolute hardest session you've ever had, but really if we anchor this to match and down here one is you're sleeping, we wanna know how hard that training session is. And that gives us a sense of intensity. We also wanna factor in, as we talked about earlier, those individual characteristics, the life load stuff, and then possibly training. You know, did I do a, a huge lower body lift before I went into this training session or do I need to go through a big lower body lift on the back end of it. And so we use this information here to understand the nature of the training load, but really the key thing that we're gonna wanna focus on is can we get this RPE on a daily basis, right? If not having the players write down the number, at least in conversation, get a sense of that one to 10. And ultimately what we're able to do is if we take how long a session was, say it was 30 minutes or 40 minutes, and we get the intensity, say it was a seven, all we do is multiply that RPE, seven, by our volume, let's say it was 30 minutes. And in that case, we get this arbitrary number of 210, and that's, so to speak, the training load number, how difficult that session was on that day. I'll show you in a moment here how you can use that to graphically simply get a sense of your progression to make sure you're not overloading that cup of water inadvertently. So to summarize, how do we manage load? One, look at your frequency. How many sessions a week? Okay, typically one to three would be the normal recommendation. Duration, how long is the session? That's by time. Intensity, how hard? That's by discussion or ideally the use of our RPE. So we have this information to then qualify what happened. Again, I just wanna show it one more time, this simple Borg RPE scale, we suggest you print off and use just to get a day-to-day -day sense of how all the players are rating the intensity. You take that number by how long the session was and you get units of training load that then you can graph and at the very least intuitively use to guide how hard training is moving forward. What other factors should we consider? Again, we've talked about this one in the middle, individuality, looking at life load and mental fatigue. But the key thing that I want to focus our time in is if we are understanding how long is a session, gradually progressing it up, how intense is a session, gradually progressing it up. The key is that we are not manufacturing training loads that cause players to do what we call as unnecessarily spike, where rather than getting that 10 to 20% increase on your back squat, you jump up 30 to 40%. And so just using your natural intuition, if we are simply twisting that dial up 10 to 20%, maybe session on session, but really week on week, 
we can safely get the player to a plateau where the total volume and the intensity of the week represents, so to speak, where you want them to stabilize. And that's going to be a little bit different for every player and every team based on the level you're at. So let me just give you a visual of what that might look like from a real world application. So thank you for Katrina for putting this together. Before I show volume or training load, this is just a way you can think about how these activities, these training activities show up. And that is as we look to return to rugby, we can think about skill-based activities being introduced immediately, right? Week one moving forward. Controlled contact development, which I know is going to be the subject of a future session here from day one. Unit and team contact development, really waiting till week three to introduce that. And then obviously game time or limited game time starting at least four weeks in, meaning you have that three week ramp up before we start looking at game style play. How does training load show up within something like that? Well, here we have a very simple example whereby we can see that there is week one, you have a given starting point from a training load perspective. Week two, we see a slight increase, maybe 10 to 20% in load. Again, that's RPE times time. And then week three, we increase again. Typically, we know from a human body perspective, we want to give space for recovery to occur. And so if we think about increasing load over three weeks and then having an unload in more of a preparatory period, we just that unload allows the body space to recover. But from there, we can see a ramp up once again until we are in a match ready state. Literally, the way we're looking at how these percentages increase can be represented in this example, where here we have a mock example of an eight week lead up to a match, whereby you can see week one, we have two sessions, week two, two sessions. Ah, guess what? Then we ramp up to three sessions, three sessions. Then we have the unload, let the body have space to recover, two sessions, and then back to three, three into a match week. If you look over on the right side, you can see again the ramp up in training time that's on feet and then the ramp up in intensity from an RPE. So that whole somewhat hard, hard, moderate, those numbers are mock RPE numbers that the player will be reporting back. So even for you as a coach, you can be thinking, hey, today I want a 45 minute session and I want it to be somewhat hard. Right. And that's going to have an RP, let's say a four or five. Then when your players are reporting back, hey, coach, that session was a six or a seven that can help you calibrate that. Wow, that session was a lot harder than I expected. The key thing is this RPE allows you to have a conversation, sampling not only how they're responding to that intensity or perceiving that intensity, but also it might give you an opportunity to probe some of those life load based questions. Yeah, I didn't sleep very well, haven't been eaten very well, so on and so forth. But it is as dead simple as tracking how long the session is and having every player give you that score between one and 10. It might seem like a lot, but once you get in the habit of doing this, you'll have better conversations and it'll ensure that you are nudging your training load at a rate the body can handle. So in summary, you want to plan your sessions accordingly. Using that last, saw, that last slide, excuse me, as a bit of a map to make sure that you're progressing up, deloading, progressing up, deloading, so on and so forth. You want to prepare, as Patrick talked about, making sure that life load is managed through regeneration, good warm up and smart progressive training as, as Katrina's skill based progression articulated. And then if we do those things correctly, we should be in a great position to perform. Final just key points for coaches versus players. As a coach, again, we want to be progressively increasing load. It's better, especially because the car has been parked in the driveway for quite a long time, that you slowly increase that load as we reintroduce. Make sure that we have a, an effective warm up. Again, the engage program and everything Patrick is sharing here is critical. Watch out for excessive fatigue. Use the RPE, your sense of what the session should be versus what the player reports 
and your own discussions with them to get a grip, to get a handle on what's going on. From a player perspective, advocate for yourself. Communicate early and often with your coach. We cannot adapt to something we don't know about. And make sure that if those conversa conversations are not happening, that you have figure out a way to make them happen. A coach needs to understand what's going on outside of training, especially if you feel as a player, it's negatively impacting what you're doing when you're in training. As I said, you'll be getting some great resources, return to rugby, as well as the player load infographic and docs from World Rugby. Thank you so much for your time today. And the next person I'd like to bring in is Jamie Turkington. Uh, Jamie Turkington is National Coach Development Manager, and Jamie is going to give, ask a few questions um, from a coach's point of view. So, uh, Jamie, uh, just send you there. Thanks, David, and thanks to Patrick, Nickel, Nick, and Katrina for for the information they've shared. You know, from Patrick, some really good practical guidelines around how to prevent injury, and um, through that RFU at Home program, and obviously keep our eyes open for for more content coming through on that. Some really good information, Nick, um, particularly around that idea of life load versus you know, with training load and, and how to how to pick up your load variations in that. And that idea that our players um, have been on the blocks for, for a while now, you know, in circumstances maybe curtailing what they can or can't do at home. You know, and I suppose when we, we delve into it and we've got the measurements around RPE and how we look at uh, training load and, and, and variations and build variations and that, is there anything that you would suggest for some of the coaches on the call so we, we could have a range of coaches on this call you know from those that are coaching children right through to coaching in the adult game and, and beyond anything practically that they could look at around trying to you get a visual cue or some guidance around what load maybe or maybe have an impact on the players on the pitch and what that might look like yeah a hundred percent i think the, the first thing is right for some individuals the whole idea of using rpe might be a little bit too much. So let's just recognize that. So if we're not using RP, can we at least use training time on feet as a starting point? So I just want to emphasize that point. Are you systematically looking at how much time on feet? Do you at the very least have your clock start and stop at the beginning end of the session? Because what we can have coaches do is they plan for a 40 minute session and then it goes and jumps up to 60 minutes all of a sudden. So just making sure as a coach, you are calibrated and prepared to know this is what I want to do from a content perspective. This is how long I want my players to be on feet because that's going to allow them to be in control of the progression that they are trying to outline for player development. Um, in so far as how the players are traveling, yeah, I think we have to have a sense in our own mind of how hard was that session meant to be from that one to ten. And if you think it's meant to be a very easy session, but the players look absolutely gassed, right? They don't appear to be recovering. Hands are on head, hips, knees, wherever the hands are, and they just don't seem to be coping. They're not quick off the ground. They're not organizing back into the defensive line as fast as they normally might. And you are frankly surprised. That's the word. You are surprised by how tired the players look. That means there is a disconnect between what you are asking them and what they are prepared to deliver. And so I want to say the word again, eyes up, be present. If you are surprised by how they seem to be physically responding, not as individuals, but as an entire team, that's a great way to know that you probably dialed it up too much. Alternatively, if they're flying and you thought you put a pretty hard session in front of them, well, that doesn't mean you double down on the next session, but that's nice feedback to say, hey, we're tracking a little bit better than we thought. I think the key thing for coaches, especially working with young players, is to be very clear in their ability to identify an effort issue versus a fatigue issue. Effort individuals usually show up for individual players, but if the entire squad seems sluggish, seems tired, and is not responding well, that is most likely a training load issue. You put too much water in the cup on that day. Thanks for that, Nick. A really good practical guidance around how we can you know, visualize what what impact training load is having on on the on the players on the pitch. One other really interesting concept to just delve into, and 
I suppose that idea of life load, particularly at the minute with our young players, you, there's so much happening, so much changing around, you know, their environment, they've been at home for so long and now they're back to school and maybe getting back into sports. Would it be fair to say that the idea of the coach um, trying to get an idea of what that, that life load is on the players through conversation with the group would be a really good example of how they can glean some information knowing that they maybe don't have the the, the questionnaires that you know, full-time players or professional players may have at their hands? My, my sense is if you're a coach, you're, you're in the business of servitude, right? You like serving others, you like supporting and developing people. So I think so much of this information will come out of, as you say, Jamie, rightly so, just having good conversations. But recognizing that you might have, you know, 32 some plus players on the pitch, can you go up to every single one of them every day? Probably not. And so are you purposely work through a warm up, through prep time, through recovery at the end of a session? Are you selecting a handful of players, especially if you see there's a few players that appear to be struggling? Right. Ah, do I give them that extra 30 seconds of the hand on the shoulder? Quick little chat. How you doing? How you feeling? How you're coping? How's everything at home? Anything we can do. And so you can take that progressive individualized approach where you call it spot check. Certainly, if you bring the whole group up, you can offer up, hey, if there's anything you feel I need to know, if you have exams or there's stress, anything that could be affecting your rugby that you just want to share with me, certainly go ahead and do that. Now, will every single player take a coach up on that? I don't think so. And so in most cases, if you can start to cultivate, you know, definitely in the teenage years and above, a small leadership group and call that your pulse check group. We even do it with the national team where fast can go just to a few players. How are the boys doing? How are we feeling? What's going on off the pitch? Anything I need to know about to help to do right by all of you from a player perspective. I think that's that's a great strategy. So spot check, certainly through your natural day to day conversations, but get those few pulse check players who you know you can go to or are chatting amongst the squad who can give you a sense of how everyone's traveling. And that can be remarkably insightful on how you manage training mode. Thanks for that, Nick. David, I'll hand back to you just for close. Thanks a million, uh, Jamie, and thanks a million to, to Nick for that as well. So just we're, we're just over the time. So we're just going to finish off with one question uh, for Nick. And it's uh, coming in from Vicky and it's how do you balance the need to monitor example training sessions RPE with the burden of measurement on players, i.e. how do you make it as simple as possible for players to engage? I have players dashing off at the end of training for work, family duties, etc. So how do you simplify that, Nick? Well, I, I think the simple it, there's two things. Three things. One, as a coach, do you value it? Right. Do you value measuring training load? Uh, two, are you prepared to bring that value to life? Are you prepared to actually collect that data? And three, are you prepared to form a habit? The first few times players are asked to quickly pause and give an RPE, they might not want to do it. Now, if they don't want to do it, you probably have not put the why and the what. So here's the order of operations. If you value it, if what we're saying today makes sense, you're like, this will allow me to be a better coach and help my players. Then you need to explain to the players why you are going to be asking them for this one through 10 at the end of every training session and why spending an extra two to three minutes before you hustle off to the car, it's worth it so that we can do right by them from a training load perspective. Then that coach needs to be prepared. So to the degree that if it's just one person, then it's one person collecting the data. But let's say maybe you cite those leadership players you have two other players that maybe help you. So instead of having one person have to collect all the data from everybody, you distribute it across coaches. Maybe there's some volunteers. Maybe there's two real strong leadership roles. We're inevitably to be tapped on the shoulder to collect the RPE at the end of a session is like, man, I'm the most responsible player this week on the squad. So am I, am I actually building this habit into the culture of best practice? and therefore having enough people asking the RPE so that you're not spending 20 minutes collecting them. And then here's the key, drum roll please, are we reporting that information back to the players? Hey everybody, even just like this, the simple graphic I showed, 
We're going to be up in our load a little bit next week. Then we're going to be bringing it down. Are we bringing this simple language into the vocabulary of talking with a player to give them a sense of the journey they're on? So value it, convey value, be prepared to realize that value and come up with an operational structure to develop the habit of collecting that one through 10 at the end of every session, multiply it by time, and you are speeding along.